Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my little presentation here. Um, I'm calling it PowerShell Management in a Nutshell. Uh, talking with Mark briefly, uh, I came up with uh, just a short, uh, a few slides to talk about what PowerShell is. In fact, there's a lot of you are new to the world of PowerShell and why you will want to be using it. And then the last half of my little talk will be a lot of demonstration, some of it showing us PowerShell in action, and then back and directory stuff at the end. And of course, there'll be time for questions or for things you have questions about or want to see. If I've got time to demonstrate it or I can in my little test room, I'd be happy to. So what we're going to talk about in the next uh, half hour or so is I'm going to talk about what exactly is Windows PowerShell. We'll talk about why it matters to you. I'm going to just highlight some key features. These are things that I think are the compelling reasons why you should be using PowerShell. Then, of course, we'll do some demos, and we'll wrap up. I'll give you a list of resources, uh, as well as take questions, and I'll maybe even have some answers. I will make the, um, the slide deck available uh, to Mark to do with what he wants. So if people want a copy of it, I'll, I'll make that available. Uh, I have updated the slide deck, Mark, since I last sent it to you, so uh, I'll send you an updated deck when I'm all finished here. Okay. All right, so quickly, who am I? Um, I am Mark's other brother from another mother. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm a Windows PowerShell MVP, um, and I'm an independent uh, author, trainer, consultant. I've written a number of books on... PowerShell, you can see the list there. Uh, I'm currently working on a PowerShell version 3 book with Don Jones and Richard Sidaway. That's the PowerShell in-depth. That'll be through Manning Press. And I'm also a professor of PowerShell. If you go to mcmag.com, I write a weekly column. You can actually subscribe and get it in your email. Short little tutorials. I've been doing this now for a couple years, so you go there, you can go back and you start the beginning, and you can learn a lot about PowerShell. Uh, I've listed links for my blog, and I am on Twitter and also Google+. Plus. There's a lot of PowerShell MVPs and active PowerShell community on Twitter, so that's a great place to uh, get connected and learn, actually, some things. All right, so enough of that. So what is Windows PowerShell? Well, Windows PowerShell is an object-oriented management engine built on the .NET framework. What I want you to think about is PowerShell is not so much a scripting language like DBScript, but it is an engine. It is Microsoft's management engine, if you will, and it is required now for all management interfaces for their products, servers, platforms, that sort of thing. So if you want to manage Exchange, that Exchange management is done on top of PowerShell. It is primarily exposed to IT professionals as a console. So a lot of people think of PowerShell as, you know, the blue screen that I type command and things happen, or I have to write PowerShell scripts like VB script. That is sort of the case, but not necessarily. PowerShell is really an engine, and it can be hosted by other applications. Uh, for example, there are scripting editors like Primal Script and Sapien that host PowerShell. So you can run kind of PowerShell command in it. Um, PowerShell Plus, another product, Power GUI. Those are all applications that kind of run this PowerShell engine. And you can still run the same PowerShell commands in all of those different little applications. But for the most part, and what I'll be talking about is PowerShell using the interactive console, and you'll see that when we get to the demo. But think of PowerShell as an engine. When we come to the management piece, PowerShell, if you need a GUI, you can have a GUI, because some people will always need a GUI, but that GUI is built on top of PowerShell. Uh, Exchange 2007 was really one of the first big products to follow this paradigm. Yes, there is a management GUI, so if I want to go in and create a mailbox, I can do that and follow through the little wizard, but when I click the button to create the mailbox, what's really happening under the hood 
is a bunch of hollow shell commands are executing. Now, senior exchange admins and those people who really want to get ahead will learn that under the hood stuff because they can be more efficient and there are a lot of things that you can't do in a GUI that you can only do from the command line. So there'll be a GUI, but it will sit on top of PowerShell. PowerShell was introduced in 2006. Uh, that was version 1. It required Windows XP and later. PowerShell will never run on Windows 2000 or anything earlier. In 2009, we got PowerShell version 2. This added uh, Windows remoting, so I could remotely connect to machines and execute commands. Uh, another nice feature was background drop and a lot of bug fixes and some new commandlets and new features in commandlet. Version 3 is will ship with Windows 8. If you have access to the Windows 8 developer preview, you can actually get a peek of that. And there is also a Windows 8 CTP community technology preview, which you can download and install and try out. I don't know when it will ship. It is now part of the operating system. So whenever Windows 8 ships, assuming it ships this year, then PowerShell version 3 will be out. And there will be down-level clients that you can download for Windows 7 and Server 2.8 R2. As far as I know, you will need to have at least Windows 7 to run PowerShell version 3. Now, it's still backwards compatible. So if you have PowerShell version 2, then Windows XP box, you can still manage that from your Windows 8 client or your Windows 7 client with PowerShell version 3. So that's where we're at with the, the version story. It does require the .NET Framework 3.0 and later. Newer versions require slightly different features. For example, if you want to use some of the graphical parts of PowerShell, like Outgrid View, that requires .NET Framework 3.5. But it does require .NET Framework, which was an issue for some servers, like Server Core, the original Server Core Server 2008. It could never run PowerShell because there was no .NET Framework for that. Server Core 2008 R2, they came up with a enough of the .NET Framework that it would support running PowerShell. It is now part of the core operating system, which means updates and new versions only come out when there is a new operating system version, which is why we'll see version 3 with Windows version 8. The other thing we're going to see with PowerShell is that there is growing adoption by Microsoft product teams. For example, Active Directory, Group Policy, uh, Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, all of these product teams over the last couple number of years have introduced PowerShell support to manage their products. Now, it's not everywhere in PowerShell, in Microsoft. Some teams are still trying to, I guess, figure out what they're going to do. But we're also seeing PowerShell being adopted by vendors, such as Citrix and VMware. A lot of vendors are using this as a selling point. Hey, we have a interface that is PowerShell to manage our product. So you could then tie in your PowerShell commands to manage your servers and their products all in one. A PowerShell really, the big thing is it's everywhere. It's going to be everywhere. So this brings up to why does it matter? In the past, as an IT pro, we needed to learn how to use different tools and techniques to manage different platforms, different operating systems, different servers. So sometimes you would use a management console. You might use a command line tool. You might use something from a resource kit, maybe something from a vendor. So a lot of different ways you have to learn to do something. Not very efficient, really difficult to do. PowerShell gives us one way to do all of it. We also used to have, and we still have then, the GUIs, right? We've got, for example, the Active Directory Users and Computers. It's a nice tool for a one-off task and create a user or a group. I can go through, click the buttons. Pretty easy to do. But it doesn't scale. If I want to create a thousand user accounts, there's no way you can do that through Active Directory Users and Computers. That just does not scale. PowerShell, again, gives us an avenue to solving that problem. What we're really coming down to is that if you want to be efficient in the enterprise, 
And that probably doesn't mean, doesn't have to mean 10,000 servers. It can mean, you know, I'm running a small, medium-sized business, so I've got 10 servers or five servers and only 10 users. But if you want to be more efficient, get more done with less, as the cliche goes, that requires some level of automation or some way of being more efficient to get work done faster with fewer, with a much smaller workload or work effort. PowerShell, again, is our solution for that. Primarily, we're going to use PowerShell through this interactive management console, and that's what you'll see in the demo. I type a series of commands, and things happen. However, those same commands, and PowerShell does support a batch-like scripting. I can take all of the commands that I might run in a PowerShell session, copy and paste them into a text file with a PS1 file extension, and that's my PowerShell script. So once you learn how to work with the console and type the commands and work with variables, arrays, and hash tables, and all that other on top of PowerShell, all those commands, that's the same thing as scripting. There's no difference between really running a PowerShell script and scripting, I'm sorry, running a PowerShell command in the console and scripting, other than typing. In the script, you only have to type it once, you just run that command, and then it'll go through all 10, 100, or 1,000 lines of command, whatever you have. That's where PowerShell becomes really efficient. A lot of people think PowerShell is scripting. It's not. It's an engine. We work with it interactively, and it just happens to support scripting. I'm a big believer, if I have it here in red, it's not a matter of if you'll be using PowerShell, if you go in and are managing a Windows environment, it's only a matter of when. I think there'll be some people who'll be using PowerShell and they won't even know it because they'll be working in a GUI, but that GUI will really be sitting on top of PowerShell. IT pros who want to get ahead will see the opportunity to learn PowerShell from the ground up and really become proficient at the interactive console and then eventually working into scripting and writing their own tools all using this PowerShell engine. So some of the key features here with PowerShell. Number one, PowerShell is an object-oriented shell. It uses objects, either .NET objects or COM objects or custom objects that you can create, not text. So in other shells, either in the window like the PMD shell or Linux shell, we spend a lot of uh, cycles parsing text. You don't do that in PowerShell. We're working with objects. And these objects are passed through a pipeline. And I pass these objects from one command to another. The commands in PowerShell are referred to as commandlets. That's that funny word at the beginning of that the third bullet point. A commandlet, as the name implies, is a little command. There's a single purpose command designed to work with objects in the pipeline. If you're familiar with the, with the Unix or Linux world, think of a simple single purpose task that those, that those commands do. I have the same thing in PowerShell. I don't have a monolithic command in PowerShell to do X, Y, and Z. I have a command that to sort, to group, to select, to filter, to get a WMI object, to get a service, to stop a service. And I can work with those objects and pass them or pipe them from one command to the other. So we've got these things called commandlets. At the end of the pipeline is my result. So I can say, get me all the objects that are service objects, but only keep the ones that have a status of running, and then display the name and the display name of those objects. That's a one-line command, and there's no scripting required. So let me give you an example here of that pipeline. Because the pipeline is the biggest paradigm shift, I think, for a lot of people coming into PowerShell. So I might run a command, say, in other shells like get service, which is actually a PowerShell command, right? And what you get back when you run get service is text output like this. You see status name, display name. Now, in other text-based shells, what you would want to do, if I want to find just these services, but say that are stopped, 
I would have to, you know, grep and talk and all that other nonsense and try to find the right column and look at the value and maybe use the regular expression patterns to find the ones where it says stuff and then reformat that. Much too complicated. Instead, we're going to do this. I'm going to write a PowerShell command, get service, which is going to retrieve, as the name implies, PowerShell commandlets always have a verb dash noun naming convention, and the noun is always the thing that you want to work with, in this case, service. So I'm going to get all of these service objects on my local computer. All right, so I'm going to get them, and some of them will have a status of running, some will have a status of stop. Okay. Now I'm going to pipe or pass them to the next commandlet in the pipeline, where object, where the status property, the dollar sign underscore says, hey, look at the first thing that's coming through. It's a service object. The status property, if that status property is equal to running, and eventually you will learn all the operators or PowerShell, the dash EQ is the equals operator. So if the status of that service equals running, I'm going to keep it in the pipeline. Otherwise, the ones that are stopped or don't meet that criteria are removed from the pipeline. Now, obviously that doesn't destroy a service, but for the sake of our command, it limits the objects that are returned. At the end of the pipeline, PowerShell knows that you're not a machine and you have to read text, so it then displays the text output, and now I can see just the running services. There was no parsing of text. All I had to do was just identify the property of the object and then filter on that. Really quite simple. Other key features uh, with PowerShell. Remote management. I can use um, .NET and WMI to gather information and manage remote computers. I want to find all the processes running on a remote machine, easy to do from my machine. You should never have to go and log on to a bunch of different servers. You should be able to do everything from your Windows 7 desktop. Function version 2 also uses um, WinRM and the WSAN protocol to execute commands on a remote machine. For this, think like um, Telnet or Secure Shell. I can create a session on a remote machine, and when I run the command, it executes on the remote machine, and then the results just come back to me across the network. With this, this is incredibly powerful, because I can run a command practically simultaneously on, you know, any number of machines, one to a thousand or more. So if I want to copy a file or start a service or stop a service on 10 machines or a thousand machines, I can do that with a one-line command from my desktop. No scripting is required at all. This is a killer feature in Windows PowerShell, I think. Some other features that might strike your fancy, uh, background jobs. If I have a command that's going to take a long time to run, I can create a background job. That command will execute in the background like, it's like we can do in the Unix world. And when I'm done, I can go back later and retrieve the results of that job. So I can kick something off and keep working in my PowerShell session. PowerShell has a really terrific integrated help system. Think man pages are in for those of you coming from the Unix or Linux work. So if I want to know how do I use this commandlet, I can ask PowerShell for help and get complete syntax and details and functional examples. PowerShell can be extended through snap-ins and modules. These snap-ins and modules can come from other Microsoft products, they can come from vendors, they can come from the PowerShell community. So if I want, for example, to manage my vSphere infrastructure, I can download PowerCLI from VMware and load that in my PowerShell session, connect to my vSphere server, and manage all of my virtual infrastructure. If you do need the script, the scripting language is really simple. 
There are a handful of constructs, like an if statement and do loop. They're really uh, simple to use. It's not nearly as complex as something like DB script. Remember, if you can run a couple of commands in the shell, that's your script. Copy and paste them, and you just don't have to type it again. The other big feature, and I think of this now as a feature, of PowerShell is that there is a large, growing, and active, very active PowerShell community. Now, there's a very popular podcast. There is the Twitter. There's a lot of stuff on Google+. Plus. There's stuff on Facebook, conferences, user groups, a lot of places where PowerShell is growing more and more. And if you can find some PowerShell people to connect with, I definitely encourage you to do that. And if there is no PowerShell user group in your area, then maybe you should start one. Um, if you have questions on how to do that, you can email me and I can get you hooked up or get you started with the right people to help start a user group. So there's a lot that we can do with PowerShell and a lot, there are a lot of resources out there that we can get help with to learn how to work with Windows PowerShell. All right, so there's my little dog and pony show with just the kind of a truly a nutshell to what PowerShell is, why it matters, and what you would get out of it if you, if and when you start working with it. So I'm going to jump over to the demo part. Most of my demos are written mostly as one-line commands. Don't try to learn PowerShell necessarily from the commands that I'm typing because you can't. Um, it's, PowerShell is a complex topic. There's absolutely no way that I can teach you PowerShell in the short time that we have. At least I can give you an idea about what it is that you can accomplish with that. So focus on the results of my demos, not necessarily the language or the, the syntax that I'm using. So I'm going to jump over to my Windows 7 console. Now this is a virtual machine that is part of a Active Directory domain. And I'm logged on. I actually have to be logged on with credentials that are domain admin just for the sake of simplicity. There are things we can do with PowerShell to script write all three credentials, but I'm just logged on with the right credentials that I need, again, just for simplicity. So I have a little demo script here I'm going to run. So let's start this thing first of all. How can we use help in PowerShell? Well, the thing to do is just ask for help. Let's say I want to find out all the things that PowerShell knows about services. I'm going to help wildcard service. Hit enter. Okay, good. There are like half a dozen or so of command lists that I can use. Get service, stop service, start service. Well, those names seem pretty clear about what those commands do. You can see the synopsis. Let's do help, get service, and this is what you will get for most every PowerShell command. I can see the name, the synopsis, the syntax, the different ways to use it, the description, some related links. I can even do this to get service. There's no sign of remarks that says for technical information, do full, but if you guess full, this gives me all the information about this command list. So there's, again, synopsis, syntax, description. Now, here's information on all those parameters. A parameter is just a, a switch or a way to customize the behavior of this command list. So I want to specify a computer name. I can do that. And this section will take multiple computer names. So I can do this for all of the parameters. And then at the end, there are examples. Get service, here's one, get service, get display name, start, network, start, that will find me all the services with network in the name. So if I want to figure out how do I work with PowerShell, I can ask for help. You can even do this one. I do get online or any of the commandlets. <coughs> PowerShell will open up your browser and take you to the online site for all the PowerShell help. 
Because the power cell health is tied to the operating system, it's very difficult to update it if there are typos or bugs or other problems with it. So you can always get the most up-to-date help by doing that dash online. So you get the same information that the matching is down at the bottom, then you get some community content. So I can see, for example, that there's a bug with example 9 in the help. So if you were trying one of the examples of other working, you could look at the online help, oh, yeah, there's a problem there. And you can come back and rate or report problems. The woman who writes this help is very eager and excited when people give her feedback, and she's very responsive to that. All right, so we can work with PowerShell. It will tell us what it is that it can do. So let's look at this get service in action. So I'm going to run get service. And I'm just going to type this to the more command so it just gives me the result of page at a time so it doesn't scroll off the screen here. All right, so there's the output. I can see status, name, display name. These are the services on my machine. Now, these are actually service objects. I'm just seeing some of the properties of those objects. You can see all of them listed there. Scroll up here. Let's do get service, and I just want to get the browser service. All right, so there it is. Nothing complicated about that. The command name, members, verb, dash, singular noun. Noun is what you want. Get service, name, service. And there is my object. Now, that is an object. I'm going to go ahead and run that command again. I'm going to save the results this time to a variable. Partial variable, by the way, we start with dollar sign. So I've got dollar s as a variable. I'm going to type that to another command called get member. Again, I'll type it to more just to control the output here. So I can see that this is a system.serviceProcess.ServiceController object. And I can discover all of the methods and properties of this object. Now, very often, a lot of the methods, you don't have to worry about trying to call because there will be commandlets, or should be commandlets, hopefully, that will handle those things. So even though, for example, you see a method here for stop a service, I'm better off to use the commandlet stop service, because it will handle all of the underpinnings and nitty-gritty of that. But I do see that there are other properties here. As long as you see what the property name is, you can use it. So I could do dollar $s dot name gives me the name property. Or the display name gives me the display name property. Now, in the default output, I don't see that dependent services or services dependent on property, but they're there. There's status, and we'll see services dependent on. All right, so that output is not in the default output, but it is there as part of the object. I can work with that if I want to. Let's go and get service for the browser service. This time I'm going to connect to a remote computer. I'm going to connect to um, the main controller. And I'm just going to select all I want is the name, the status, and the machine name property. So there we go. No scripting, really. I just ran the command, connected to the domain controller. Got the browser service. I can see that it's stopped. And I can see the machine name. Here's another example if you look at using the filtering. So I'm connect to two domain controllers where the status equals running. And I'm going to sort by machine name and display name. So I'm going to get all those service objects on those two machines then sort them. And then I'm going to take the output, those objects, and format as a table, group to buy machine name, display a couple of properties, and I'm going to auto size it. And there we go. There's DC02 and DC01. So these are all the running services, grouped by machine name, and sorted. There was no Again, gripping or off, I didn't have to parse the text. I just worked with the objects that come through that 
pipeline. At the end of the pipeline, PowerShell presents my results to me. All right? So that's how easy it is to work with objects. Let me give you a quick look at some remoting scenarios. We use a commandlet here called enter PF session. I'm going to connect to my file and print server. Now this remote connection is using the WinRM and the WSAN protocol. So PowerShell version 2 is installed on FP01 and remoting is enabled. Notice so my prompt change. And now I have at the beginning of the prompt in square brackets, I can see that I am in fact connected to another machine. So this again is like a secure shell or a telnet session. All the commands that I'm going to run here are executing on FP01. It's just as if I had gone to that machine and logged on interactively. That they're doing it remotely from my desktop. So I can do any command, like the host name command. I can see I'm on phisp01. If I run the get service command, this get service command is executing on that machine, and I get the results back. While I'm here in the service screen, let me show you something else here. I'm going to change directory to something hkom colon. We do a directory listing. I am logged into the HP local machine registry hive on my remote machine. I can navigate the registry just as if it was a file system. So I can do software, Microsoft. And what I'm doing, by the way, is typing like WIN, hitting tab, and it's tab completing because it knows that that's the tab that I want, current version. So even though it looks like there's a lot of typing, you can take advantage of things like tab completion, make it easier, right? So there are all the registry entries under each Google machine, software, Microsoft Windows, current version. Go back to my C drive. Go back to the root of C. Right. So I can navigate the file system just like you would in the CMD shell, except all these things are objects. Now remember, I am on my file and print server. It's my, my file server, so I'm going to do a directory of the IT share, which would be shared from the C shares IT folder. That's where are the files that if I could, was accessing this through the regular share process, that's what I would see. I want to find out how big this is. How much space is this folder taking? So I can do directory. C share IT. I'm going to recursively go to every subdirectory. Now I'm going to measure this. And I'm going to measure on the length property, which is really the size property. I want to get the total size, I want to get the maximum, which would be the largest file size, and I want to get the average. So there we go. I have a new object, which is this measurement object, so I can see there are 603 files, average size, some maximum. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this command back. I'm going to save this to a variable dollar stats. So let's do dollar it. So now dollar it. If I type this get member, all right. You can see it's a generic measure info object. You can see the property. So I can access the property. Remember, the object name, which in this case is dollar it. Period. Count. So there are six hundred and three files. The average, I use tab completion there. That's for that value for the average. For the sum. Oh, this was fun. Let's take that sum because that value is in bytes, and I want to know what it is in megabytes. There it is. I've got about 793 megabytes of data in the IT file share. So I can execute whatever I want, and I can also do other commands 
remotely. Right now what I have is an interactive session. In the next demo, I'm going to show you how we can access remote machines run a command at the same time on all of those machines. So this is really a very powerful tool. So I don't have to go and log on to the machine. I can open up a remote session, do the things I need to do, if there's no other way to do but interactively, uh, and then log off. Log off, I'm going to do exit, and that terminates my session. Now I'm back to my regular machine. Do another demo here. So we create a variable called dollar computers. So I don't have to keep typing all these computer names. All right, so I'm going to basically say my two commands here called invoke command. And I'm going to run in the next set of curly braces. I'm going to run the get service browser command. And this will run on the remote machine basically all three machines at the same time, and then the results will come back to me. So I press enter. I can see that it stopped on DC01, running on final print 01, and stopped on DC02. So that command, now in this case I just did three machines, because if it would be within 30, 300, or 3,000, they all run on those remote machines, which all take time, and the results come back to my machine. So if the service is stopped, let's say I want to make sure that the browser service is running on all those machines. Well, I don't want to have to go and log on to each machine interactively or handle them one at a time. So I can write a little block of code, and I'm going to save this as a variable. This is going to be a script block, a little block of code. So I'm going to get the browser service, save it to variable dollar service. Now this is kind of scripting, but I can do it interactively in the shell. So if the service object, if the status property is equal to stop, then I'm going to write a message to the screen. So that it's starting the service on the computer name, and I'll write that in green text. And I'm going to take that service object and type it to the start service command list, and do dash pastor so they'll write the results to the pipeline. Otherwise, if it's already running, then I'm just going to display the service object. And then close that. All right, so I've got this little block of code. And I'm going to run invoke command and run that block of code on all three computers. Let's scroll up a bit here so I've got some room. And I messed something up in my little code. Assuming I fix my bug, that should have worked. It works fine when I ran it earlier, so I'm just going to just trust it. It does work. I'm going to press on here. All right, so that is another way of start service. There we go. So that's another way to do I just restarted the browser service, and now I know that it's running on all of those machines. And it scales up nicely, so it's a nice way of working with remoting. All right, so the last set of demos I have here, and I wanted to show you, I could more mention this really what you're interested in, in managing Active Directory with PowerShell. Now, the stuff that I'm going to show you requires the Active Directory uh, web console, web management interface, which you get with Windows Server 2008 R2. 
or you can download a client that you put on your down-level domain controllers, and then you would do this as I'm doing for my Windows 7 client. I've got the remote server administration tools installed and the Active Directory component configured. So when I do that, I get a module that I can use to manage Active Directory. So a module is extra functionality that I can load into my PowerShell session. On this machine, these are the features that I can add in. So I'm going to go ahead and import my Active Directory module. Take a moment. All right, so now I have new commands. Well, what are those commands? I'm going to use the expression get command at the Active Directory module. And so I'm going to type it in more so I can control the paging. All right, so these are all the new commands that I have because I imported that module. This is like adding an AD computer service account, getting an AD force, getting an AD group. All right? So all those things that you would typically do, managing Active Directory, I now have command line tools, PowerShell tools that I can use. So let's use one of them. Let's get a user account. Let's get my user account. So I'm logged on as Jeff. So I'm going to get a user Jeff. I can actually the main controller, and this is the object that that command that returns to me from Active Directory. You can see the distinguished name. This returns just a small subset of properties, just the bare minimum I might need to identify the user. If I want, I can retrieve more properties. Let's so get a user Jeff. Dash property, use the wild card. I'm going to type this to get member and more, just again, control paging. All right, so you can see that this is a Microsoft and Active Directory dot management AD user account or object. You can see all of the properties that are listed there. So once I know what the property name is, if I want to see just that property, then I can include that in that dash properties parameter. I'm going to create a variable to hold some of those properties. So I don't have to keep typing them. We do name, title, department, when created, and when changed. All right, so all of those are saved to that variable, which is technically something called an array in PowerShell. So I can do get aiding user get, specify my array or collection of properties. And I'm just going to select basically just those properties again. And there we go. So now I have my AD user account, and I got the properties that I wanted to see and nothing else. Again, no scripting. I just ran the command with to return the object, and I just work with the properties of that object. Let's return, because I can do this for one, let's return all the prop, all the objects. I'm going to get all of the user accounts in the employees OU. In my domain. And I'm just going to select the password expired and password last set properties. So select the name same account name, and those password properties. So I'm basically going to build a little password report of all the users in my domain, actually all the users in that employees OU and in child OU. And I'm also, while I'm at it, I'm going to create a new property, a custom property called password date, which will take the current date, but the get date in parentheses, and subtract the password last set property of every object that I get back. And I'm going to sort on that new property that I created in descending order and make it pretty as a table. And there we go. So these are all of the user accounts in my employees OU. You can see the name, the same account name, the password expired, password last set, and there's password A. My formatting is a little off because I had to readjust the font size so that you could all see it, but there's my properties, objects, 
format it gets results in no scripting. That's the I think is the great thing about Power Tools. I can do an amazing amount of work with just a little effort. Now, of course, the learning curve. You have to learn how to do this. I mean, I'm just, you know, whipping this out because I've done this repeatedly. So the more you use this, the more you'll be able to learn how to work with it. Let's look at something else. Let's say I want to create a new user. This is where I think Power Tools really excel. And especially when I get looking at something like Active Directory. One of the things that I can do with PowerShell is I can take any CSV file and turn them into objects. So there's a command called import CSV, and I have a CSV file of a new hire. So I import it, I get Chip Shots, uh, Plumber, Bill Greeley, Terry Clark, and Skip Town. Okay? So I have all of these new people, they're all in the CSV file. Now, nothing's been created yet. All I did was just import that, and that created some custom objects and brought them to the pipeline. Now, because I'm going to be using these users' this information repeatedly, I'm just going to save this to a variable. I'm going to re-import it. And even though there are only a handful here, I can only have five, this could easily be... 50, 500, 5,000, whatever you might need. So now I have these new user objects. I want to create them in Active Directory. Well, I would know from looking at the commandlet and in the module that there's a command called new AD user, which is like that might be used straight as that. So I look at the help, right? And see a lot of syntax, a lot of parameters, and I can see all of the Examples, I could look at full help, I could look at just the examples. I do know, to use this though, this requires a password for all of the new user accounts. And so I'm going to give it a new user account password. And this has to be specified as something called a secure string. So I'm using the read host. And we type in my password. So now I have the default user password for all of these new user accounts. So now I can take dollar new. That's my collection of those imported custom objects. Now because the property names of the objects line up or match the parameter names of new AD user, I can just type this to new AD user and it will hook up the properties and I can specify just the other property that I want, such as puts on the account password, whether I want to do um, enable the account, because by default they're not enabled, so I'm going to enable it. And then I'm also going to pass through so that I can see it. I'm also using a parameter here called dash what if. So if I had wanted PowerShell to do this, it would have run the new AD user account on those objects and created those user accounts. Cool. I didn't get any errors. Everything looks the way it's supposed to be. Then I could do set AD user because I want to now modify the user account so that it will if you force to change the password at next logged on, so I can look at how to modify that, and I can see that there is a parameter for dash change password at log on. So let's rerun my command now, so that I can put all of this together. So let's do this dollar new. I'm going to type it again to that new AD user. Remember, nothing happened the first time. It was just what if. So new AD user will create the user account and then pass that object to the next command link, which in this case is going to be set AD user, or I'm going to use the change password at logon parameter, set that to dollar true, and then pass those objects. And there we go. I have now just created five user accounts with the default password, and they need to change the password at their next log on. So I can tell the user, hey, here's your initial password. You need to change it the first time you log on. Very easy. Again, that was five. Could have been 50. Could have been 500. 
The hardest part is getting, if you get the CSV file set in the right way, then creating the account is incredibly fast. Look at that. I mean, that was like microseconds to create five user accounts. There's no way you could create five user accounts manually using Active Directory users and computer. All right, so let's get these accounts. Let's add them to some groups. And so there, I just want to show you, I've got the accounts. If they do exist, I retrieve them again just to show that that account didn't work and there was nothing up my sleeve. So what I'm going to do, because some of these people are in Omaha, I'm going to add them to the Chicago sales group. So this command will call get AD group. All right, so here are all of the groups in my Active Directory domain. And the command will make it very easy to retrieve that. Let's just get the Chicago sales users group. All right, so I can see that it is a universal security group name. It's the same as name. Let's find out who belongs to this group right now. He's going to get AD group member. All right, so I've got two people who currently belong to this group. I've got Alfredo and Jack Cross. They're the current members of this group. So let me create a variable dollar new sales. So I'm going to take my data that's in dollar new, where the title matches sales. The so dollar new sales is the uh, skip town who is the regional sales manager, and Sherry Clark, who is sales rep, right? So those are the two user accounts that eventually I'm going to add to that group. The command let's use is add AD group member, so I can say, hey, how do I use that? Let's look at help. So there are all the, there's the description. Actually, what probably would be a better help is look at the examples. All right, so I specify the name of the group and then the people that I want to add to the group with that dash member. So I need to specify basically the distinguished name of the user option. All right, that's the key part here. So I'm going to add a group member, Chicago sales user, and the members. So the members I'm going to add, I'm going to do a little nested pipeline expression here where we take that new sales object which remember has those two information for those two users, type them to for each, get the active directory user account for each of those, because that's where the distinguished name is. And they should have just now been added to that Group. So let's get the group member again. This toggle sales you go. Right, and there we go. So now you can see uh, I've added Terry and Skip. So managing groups with Active Directory and PowerShell is really, again, very simple once you learn to work with the man list. I want to take, I want to find all the users that have the city set to Omaha, and I'm just going to Right now, I'll just look at the name, right? So I've got Bark, Skip, Terra. So get not only the people who I imported, but also some existing accounts like Bark, right? So I'm going to get those users that have the city of Omaha. And I'm going to change them and change their city to Chicago. And also change the description to say all Omaha users. So now if I do the description equal all Omaha users, retrieve the properties of city and description, and then so select the name city and description of the resulting object. There we go. So there are the accounts and there's just the information that I need. 
Let's just say we'll be a count. That could be fun. You might need to do that. So all of the users who are in the sales department and the city equals Chicago. Again, we use the set AD user and the set dollar be enabled to false. Then I can use what if. So if I wanted to, but I'd run that command without guess what if, it would have disabled those two accounts. Let's go ahead and do it for real. We'll do dash pass through just so I can see the result, what it processes. And then I'm going to pipe that to get AD user and select the properties of the department and city. And select the name, whether it's enabled, department, and city. So there I can see that Skip and Terry are now both disabled. So managing PowerShell or managing after record PowerShell, very simple. If I want to delete the user accounts, let's say I want to delete all these people who are, I entered on today's day. So maybe at a later date, I go back and I grab that CSV file. I can re-import it. And for each entry, I'm going to use get AD user and get that same account name. That property is part of that imported custom object. I'm then going to get the corresponding Active Directory user account, type it to remove the AD object, and I'm going to do confirm the fault. I don't want to be prompted every time to delete it. I just know that that's what I want to do. And now they are gone. If I try to get, for example, if I try to get um, Terry Cloth again, I get an error because she has been removed. So that is how easy it is to manage Active Directory with PowerShell. We're working with objects in a pipeline. Once you learn the command list and the, and the parameters, you can start constructing these techniques to do the things that you would need to do. If you have something that you do a lot, for example, that importing, say, a CSV, and maybe you want to do some other things with information, such as creating a mailbox or a home folder, that you could then put in a script, and then you just run your script when you need to do it. You don't have to type it. You know it's going to be consistent. Those are the things that PowerShell really brings to the table. Right, so let me go back to the slides real quickly. In terms of some resources, um, certainly a number of books. Um, you can start with the Windows PowerShell 2.0 TFM that I co wrote with Don Jones from Safety and Press. This is a complete reference book. If you read from start to finish, you will know everything that you need to know in order to manage Windows, manage your environment with Windows PowerShell. Uh, the books, really, that Don and I write are aimed at IT pros. Don also has a very nice book called Learn PowerShell in the Month of Lunch It, which does exactly what the name implies. Uh, that's from Manning. Once you have some foundation for PowerShell, then grab a copy of the Windows PowerShell cookbook. I believe it's the second edition by Lee Holmes, who is uh, on the PowerShell team at Microsoft, and think it's hard to learn PowerShell, but once you know what it is that you can do, you can kind of build from there. And if you really want to get deep under the hood, make your brain hurt, but become really smart, uh, then you want to get PowerShell in Action by Bruce Payette, also on the PowerShell team, also in the second edition, also from Manny Prep. Uh, in terms of web resources, I've got my, um, my blog. Uh, I call it the Lonely Administrator. You certainly should be looking at the PowerShell team blog, although right now there's not necessarily a lot of new stuff because they're um, heads down working on version 3, so they're not necessarily blogging a lot. And there's the link for my professor PowerShell column. If you're looking for more formal training, uh, I last year did a kind of a PowerShell crash course called Windows PowerShell Fundamentals Training for Train Signal. And I also did a longer course, Windows Server 2008 PowerShell Training, which goes through how do you manage the registry or file system or file sharing or printers, 
all the things that you would typically need to do to Nike Pro, and I show you how to do it using Windows PowerShell. If you get a chance to get to conferences such as TechEd, TechNetro, or the Experts Conference, or the PowerShell DCI, also lots of great avenues for learning PowerShell. And lastly, I also do private and public training for anyone who cares to uh, have that sort of thing. All right, so there are a lot of resources, books, websites, a lot of training resources to discover more. But the biggest thing you can do, your biggest resource, is to start using PowerShell every day. So with that, are there questions or are there other things that you would like to see in PowerShell that I might be able to demonstrate? Just one second, Jeff. Okay. I got a quick question. Um, some of us here would probably be looking at doing system administrator jobs or help desk jobs, and I could see how the the PowerShell can really help doing some stuff with Active Directory could save a lot of time. Is is PowerShell something that we could take your Active Directory PowerShell book and pick up and start from there, or do we need to have a better base of PowerShell before we start getting into the Active Directory stuff with it? I think you would be better off if you had a foundation in PowerShell before you start picking up the Active Directory pieces. Otherwise, you'll be struggling trying to figure out how do I use the Active Directory pieces and how am I supposed to be using the PowerShell pieces. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just I think you'll be better off if you get the foundation first and then pick up the PowerShell, the Active Directory pieces afterward. But you're you're smart in thinking that going into a help desk position or things like that, if you can say, hey, I have these PowerShell skills, I think that will be a big differentiator. Okay, perfect. Do we have one more? Um, a lot of the smaller non-enterprise companies don't always keep the best records for their equipment. Is PowerShell able to handle cataloging computers for what they have on them, hardware as well as software? Yes. For that, you would use Windows Management Instrumentation, or WMI. Let me go back real quick and show you how easy this is to do in PowerShell. In DB Script, we could do the same thing, but it was really complicated. It took a lot of coding. But in PowerShell, there's a commandlet called get WMI objects. If I wanted to find out, for example, show me all of the logical disk information, and all I want are the fixed disks. So those are the ones on my machine. But hey, show me the ones on um, the Chicago file and fit server. So there we go. So I can see that on Chicago FT01, I've got a C drive and an F drive, and I can see the free space and the size. Now, this information I can export to a TXD file. I could turn it into XML. I could create an HTML page if I wanted to find out. Let's do, say, operating system. And whatever I can do for one machine, I could do for 10 or 100 machines. All right, so I can see. Now, that is actually, there's more information there than what you see on the screen. That object has all of these other properties, so I can work with that wherever you want. So the thing that you'll be, you would be using to do that type of inventorying is WMI. So we use the shortcut for that, get WMI object, WMI. A Win32 underscore computer system. And let's do yeah. All right, so my domain controller is running, uh, you can running virtual box. And okay, I can jump into I can open up uh, PowerShell on my Laptop. So this is real PowerShell. I say real is not as close to virtual system. 
All right, so you can see that I'm running a Chichibro, Cosmo X505. You can see the computer name and how much memory. So, so yes, all of that information you can get through WMI, and it's much easier to do, I think, in PowerShell than it was in DBScript or other languages. Good question. And then the software side of it, is there easy commands behind that one as well, I assume? Yeah, there is a WMI class. It takes a long time to query, so I won't do it here. Now I can start. Well, actually, what I would do, first job. All right, so I'm going to run the command get WMI object for the Win32 product class. I'm going to run it as a background job. All right, so now I get my PowerShell prompt back. Once, and that'll take a long time to run. Once that is done, I can then retrieve the job results, and that will show me all of the software that's installed, or at least the stuff that's installed uh, using basically the Windows installer. And, you know, if someone happens to have a resource kit tool, just a command line tool or an XE that they downloaded, that it may not necessarily pick up, um, but this would bring back things like Microsoft Office that sort of thing. A lot of the third-party and other larger enterprise management tools actually all leverage WMI anyway. You can get a lot of the same information yourself right through PowerShell very easily. Okay. What else? One more question as Active Directory goes. Okay. Is there a way to use, like, uh, say you don't want to run a check against, like, computers in your sales department or something. You know, you don't want to flood your network for whatever reason. Is there a way to use Active Directory to reference the computers you want to get a hold of rather than getting their uh, their direct names? Yeah, you can use, I mean, you can use Active Directory. There's a command called get AD computer. So let me get all of them. All right, so like those are all the computer accounts in Active Directory. You could search it by OU if you wanted to. Um, depending on what you're doing, like if you use the invoke command like I was doing, there's actually a parameter that you can use to throttle the number of machines that you connect to remotely. So you don't have to worry about overwhelming um, bandwidth on your network. So there are, things, there are some things built into PowerShell to kind of handle that so you don't have to worry too much about that. Is that, the kind of, is that what you were asking? Exactly, yes. Thank you. Question? Any other questions? So you're speaking now. Not talking. <laughs> 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 hey, right, everybody. Just want to ask you an question. How much can a regular user see using PowerShell versus an administrator? Um, okay, so the question, how much will a, a regular user be using PowerShell versus an IT Pro or admin? Yeah. Uh, so right now, my opinion is that PowerShell is aimed at IT professionals. It's not something an end user should need to worry about at all. Unless you want them to run a command in order to, to do something. Now, there are some things in Windows 7 like the troubleshooter that you can use, that actually is running some PowerShell scripts under the hood. There's another example of someone using PowerShell and not even knowing it. Um, but for the most part, end users don't need to know that PowerShell exists. Uh, what's nice about this, especially like the remote thing, like in a help desk, you could remotely connect to a Windows desktop. Now, the user would not even know that you are logged on, and you could do commands just as if you were sitting on their computer. And you can't really interact with that. It's not like a remote desktop, uh, but you can have a session on that desktop just as like you would a session on a server. So really, my belief right now is that Windows 7 and all the clients PowerShell is more for IT pros, not for end users. Any other questions?
does the command you put through for PowerShell, is that restrictable like you can restrict active directory access for uh, people's uh, resources? Like say I'm an IT administrator whose you know, job is schema, and he goes to use PowerShell, does he have the ability to add users and stuff like that? PowerShell will only do or execute what you have, what your credentials have privileges and rights to do. All right, so PowerShell doesn't add, give you any more power than what your account already has. All right. So if the account I'm using has the ability to create user accounts, it can do it. If it has the ability to delete user accounts, it will do it. If I can do one but not the other, then that's what I can do. So PowerShell doesn't change any of that. Now it, there are a number of commandlets that allow you to specify an alternate set of credentials, so you can be logged on and spend most of your time with you know non-elevated credentials. Then when you need to do something like a domain and admin, you can say, oh, here are my domain admin credentials, pick me God, and let me do my thing, and then when you're done, you're back to being a normal user. But you shouldn't have to worry about PowerShell letting a user do something that they can't do. If they can't do it, because they don't have the privileges, PowerShell won't make it, won't give them that power. It just makes it easier for, the do, for them to do it if they have the privileges and permissions in the first place. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. You know? No? We're good. We're good, Jeff. Hey, thanks for uh, taking the time to do this for us, Jeff. And, uh, it's pretty informative. Hey, I Great. Right. Well, you know, if you need anything, um, people are to feel chat with people, and if I ever get back out to Omaha, we'll have to get together and do a, a PowerShell event of some sort. Sounds good. All right. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much, guys. Good luck. Right, take care. Bye. Bye.